Like I said, I studied computer science in college, and I worked as a sysadmin in the lab. I would work all the Friday and Saturday night shifts. So while everyone else was at parties, I was in the server room. And still to this day, I love that feeling. And you only really get it when you have, I mean, back then the computers were so loud and noisy and it was negative degrees in, in, in the lab, but you only get that in a data center. And so I actually love going to data centers now. I'm currently working on starting my own company, um, but my background has been in cloud computing and large scale distributed systems. I got a a lot of experience around kind of three different types of big data. There's the incoming, like crawling and bringing in all that data really fast. And then there's kind of the data crunching, which is MapReduce, Hadoop. But then there's the third type, which is this needle in the haystack. You know, the traditional search where you have so much data and you're looking for this one little thing, but to serve it very quickly. My name is Kate Matsudaira. I'm a CTO and software engineer and member of the ACM. It all depends on how you think about your data. Um, when it comes to large scale or big data, it really, it, it's so dependent on each use case, right? Like I was talking about the search engines and there's you know, the problem of how do you bring in all the data really fast, right? Like if you look at Twitter, um, you, you, don't, you can't scroll back to necessarily get years of tweets, right? Even though they've been around because you can't, um, there becomes a problem with having all that data readily available quickly. And so, and then with databases, you know, things are really fast when they can fit into memory, when they can fit into a cache. Um, and so you've got, you have infinite dollars and everything can just be in memory and really easily accessible, um, then that might make sense. But even then that's hard, right? Because you've got to route it to know where to go and then, then you become a problem of like, how do you handle all these incoming requests and routing everything? So every point there's a different challenge. So, you know, like I said, it depends on your business use case, but it really comes down to your data and how it's accessed and, and how you want to make that available to people. If you think about a traditional web system or, a, you know, kind of a standard service-oriented architecture, you have your, your front-end client, you have some middleware, and then you have a back-end database. And so people will say, okay, well, let's add replicas. Right, and then, and then that gives you um, redundancy and potentially some scalability because you can reach it, but then you're still kind of limited on how much you're fitting into one box. And so then people will introduce things like different types of NoSQL from key value stores, document stores, these sort of things, but there's still some operational overhead. I mean, every single machine or instance that you add um, to that equation is something that you have to maintain. It's something that you have to operate. And so there's a, a lot of challenges that come with that. And one of the more interesting things that I've seen people do is then put caches, right? So you put you cache part of the database and you can have like one uh, giant cache um, to kind of hold everything or you can have you know individual service level caches or both. But then you're still limited about like what can fit into the cache. And one important thing to remember is that reading from memory is so much faster um, than reading from disk or reading across the network. And so the closer your data is to those requests, and, and ideally if it's on the same memory in the same box that you're querying, then that's when you're going to get the best locality of data. When it comes to data types, even understanding more about the internal implementation. So for example, in Java, if you use a standard hash map, there are, um, it uses a, you know, kind of a traditional chaining approach. So for every kind of slot in the hash map, you're, you're allocating the overhead of a, a little array or map. Versus if you use, say, there's a collection called Trove that uses, instead of kind of the traditional chaining approach, it uses um, probing. So it will, uh, it doesn't have the overhead of all those maps, so it takes up a lot less space and memory. And these sort of small tweaks can actually then allow you to fit a lot more data inside your application and in memory. Um, so being smart about your data choices. Another thing is building your system to 
really take advantage of these properties, which I always talk about trying to be data store agnostic, where you think about loading your data from flat files and picking a file format that is universal, so not some you know, thing that you cooked up on your own, things like JSON and CSV that you can read 10 years from now. Because with things like cloud storage and various stuff, in some ways, storage is infinite. I mean, gone are the days when your pager went off because your server fills logs <laughs> that you filled up the disk, right? Like that happened <laughs> enough to me. Um, but you know, now you can kind of keep files forever if you want to. And so if you think about backing up your data and think about your reference data as let me load this from files in the file system and you have a logical way of storing them, all of a sudden you're a lot more scalable. You can choose you know, kind of what you load and what you don't load into the system. And you can load it into a relational database if you want. You can load it into a Redis. You can load it into a memcache, um, whatever. And if the data store is ephemeral, in some ways it doesn't matter because you have these kind of golden sets of data um, in your file system. And so that gives you, um, particularly in cloud type architectures, a lot more flexibility for um, what you can do and how you can do it. And so as you grow then, let's say going back to the original question of if you're building an application, what do you do? As your, your needs change and you learn more about how are our customers actually using our data? Um, what do we actually need to surface? What needs to be in the cache? Uh, building something like that that isn't built on, oh, this has to be in MySQL or this has to be in, in some specific format, you, you open yourself to a lot more options and a lot more uh, flexibility. When it comes to routing, partitioning, sharding data, again, it, it comes down to your, your use case. But the important thing to think about is, is how you do it. And it's hard to prescribe, like, this is the best way of doing it, because I think it depends a lot on each application. But I mean, generally, you want to have some sort of replication of some sort, whether it's replication to files in a file system or something. You need to have redundancy if your data is important to you. Now, if it's not, which sometimes it's not like temp files or uh, temp images or what have you, then maybe that's OK. But in the cloud, especially, you need to think about, OK, what's, what's going to happen when this instance goes away or this, this uh, thing becomes non-functional? Where, where is my failover? Um, and how am I going to you know, rescue the, the situation. And so it really becomes about, you know, how do you partition the data? And there's some really logical ways. I mean, alphabetize things. If you have a nice numbering system, that works really well. Time-based can work. It, again, it depends on your data set. But the important thing is whatever scheme you pick, that it's extensible. Um, so that if you're not saying, OK, everything, we're going to divide everything in two, and, and everyone goes one way or the other, then you need to think about, OK, what happens when we need a third or a fourth? And so really thinking about, OK, how does that work? And so that you're not going to have to rewrite all the logic um, that does the routing. It'd be, it's nice to be smart. And it's also nice that you know where to go and with like a math calculation. There's not a lookup across the network to some, some uh, server. So thinking about hashing the data. Um, so maybe you, know, you divide your data set and then you hash on the ID or something and that tells you where to go. Um, because if you have to do a lookup, then that can really slow you down. Although hopefully um, you're not going over the network in some central server that's routing everyone. You can do that you know, on the fly where the requests are coming in. Um, but just always thinking that every time you have to move, every time you get further and further away from the data, that that's additional latency. And that hurts your performance. And that hurts your ability to do things quickly. And I don't care if you're doing a massive distributed computation on Hadoop or you are just serving a, you know, customers via your website. That latency is time, which is money, either in lost sales from your customers or the additional time it's going to take you to do that computation. And so just really thinking through, OK, how do I keep my data as close to the request as possible? So I've been the super early adopter for uh, cloud when Amazon first came out. I remember when they just had S3 before EC2 even launched. But uh, an interesting problem that we had was we had this um, really popular API that served a lot of requests. And the interesting thing that happened was um, if you were using the Elastic Load Balancer 
and there wasn't, um, it didn't work exactly like other load balancers. And so we kind of had everything coming through there and then traffic would be routed accordingly uh, based on, you know, kind of these one servers and then to other servers. But the thing was, we couldn't blacklist people at the load balancer. They had to get to our servers before we rejected them. And so what then happened was if accounts were delinquent for us, and we were doing, you know, um, I think one of our highest peak rates was like 40,000 requests per second, but uh, it's pretty wild, right? Yeah. So, uh, so really high volume incoming requests um, because these people are doing a lot of queries against the data. And it was so interesting because if a person's account was delinquent, we would then reject them. But a lot of the, our customers had written scripts to use the data, and so we would then have to, they'd have to hit our servers and then we'd reject them. But then they would keep trying again and keep trying again, and so we ended up just being overloaded from people that weren't paying us, that weren't necessarily our customers, that had written these bad scripts, and it became more of a people problem of how do we turn them off, because there was no easy way for us to block them without them hitting our services. And so, um, it was, it was this, then what we ended up doing and how we solved it was we partitioned so that those people all were routed to one place and if they overwhelmed each other, that was okay. <laughs> right, so then it became a partitioning scheme that we could leverage because we didn't have those same flexibilities. Now in a regular network situation, you could have rocked them at the router and like with the hosting, but that, those sort of levers weren't available to us back then. And I think now ELB is far more mature, but I kind of think about those things as a horror problem um, that partitioning helped us solve, but it was a nightmare at the time. <laughs>I think ta thinking about the feedback cycle and really how do you learn from what you do? How do you take um, the experiences and how do you take these examples and, and evolve it and, and help use it to make your systems better is a really important question. So one thing is really understanding your metrics. So knowing what success looks like from a technology perspective. I, a lot of the time people know from a business perspective, but you don't always necessarily say, okay, if this project is successful, um, what will the metrics be? What will the usage be? What, um, what will, and, and so for search, for example, I, I always think about this as a great example. We developed um, what we called our stock index. So think of it like the Dow Jones, but of web pages. And so ours, we'd have this list of like a thousand web pages and kind of the ranking that we thought we should be in. And so if our algorithms didn't rank them in that ranking and there were anomalies um, when things were out of order, then that became a very interesting uh, sort of problem. And so it was this, it wasn't a success metric in like, oh, we have X pages or whatever. It, it was a correctness, kind of we expect things to kind of look this way. And having those sort of instrumentation and thinking about those early on before you even build your V1, it's sort of like, test-driven development in a way, but I think about it as more like business metrics-driven de development. Um, and because that then helps you also hone in on what, what is the actual problem you're solving? And is it the right problem? And these metrics don't have to come from a manager, or like, you know, an executive. Like, they can come from the people actually building it. Um, and hopefully that they, you know, even as engineers, you're thinking about, okay, what, why is what I'm doing important? And what is um, the outcomes? And so I often think about it like that. It's like you just have to get people. People are good about thinking like that when it comes to like functionality, right? That's And like, oh, I'll write these tests, and that will tell me. But this is kind of like a business test. And so if you do that, um, and that's true of any distributed system. Like, where are you spending your time? Have you built um, something that's actually uh, cost effective, right? Like, and so that's where profiling tools come in and performance. So I kind of think about it from all these different perspectives around, you know, how do you know, and then how are you going to monitor and track it and, and come up with something easy. I feel like I've used a million different monitoring things, and I don't really love any of them. I, I think have something. Um, I, I think you, what you need is both something that is very real time, but also something that shows you trends over time. Um, you need to be looking at not just um, what's the average use case, which I actually think is terrible, but really looking at, you know, what is your median, what's your 95th, what's your 99, so you percentile, um, so you really see how things are happening. I think 
you know, if you look at things like indexes or, or kind of having this representative sample of what we would expect the outcome to be, and, and that's something I think you see a lot with data science, like, like this notion of a golden set. Um, first, make sure that you're not training your stuff on the golden set because <laughs> that's not very helpful. Um, but you can use uh, humans like Mechanical Turk or um, other things to help with some of that or even just hire people to come in for two days and be like, you know, go through these results and make sure they look right on head products or head uh, terms or queries. Um, so I think thinking about that, thinking about how you're going to test it, not being afraid to not solve the testing with technology, I think is another thing that, you know, we always... I know I fall into this. It's, it's like, oh, I can write a program that does this, but sometimes it's actually better to say, okay, you know what, let's, let's have a person do this because they'll just do a better job. Um, but really thinking through all those, I think everyone needs to know how to use a profiler. <laughs> I, it's one of those skills I feel like has is, is been lost recently for some reason, um, mostly because I've talked to people and I'm like, well, have you profiled door code? And they're like, no. So whatever language people are working in, I hope that they learn how to do that. Um, because it is really helpful, like even if you are performance tuning, just running a profile on how your application works can just tell you a lot about uh, what's going on and, and what different things are happening in different areas of your code or your system. And so, um, you know, those sort of things. But a, a metric is only good if you're actually paying attention to it. So I would also say it might be good to measure everything, but pick out like the five things that matter. Um, and my, kind of my favorite story about this is, uh, you know, I always think about it as like if you're on a desert island or whatever, what are like the five things that you would want to know? Uh, or you're stranded. And so um, our sysadmins in, in the last couple of companies I've been at had like Kate screen, which was the screen that I wanted to see, which had like the five or ten things that I cared about. And they might have, you know, 20 or 50 things on their screen. But typically you can boil down to like the things that matter most. And I think that's a really important exercise, rather you're an engineer working on the system or a manager kind of controlling the team uh, and responsible for the whole thing. So management and leadership is kind of something really close to my heart, um, especially in tech, because I never wanted to be a manager. I used to talk about the managers as like, they were just overhead and bureaucracy and the pointy-haired people on Dilbert. Like, I was not... Um, I was not a good employee. Like, <laughs> I did not like management. So it's very ironic that that has now been like the last 10 years of my career. That being said, though, I think that I also had to work really hard to be a manager. It wasn't something that was my natural inclination. I was much happier to sit in my office with the door shut writing code um, than I was to go to a meeting and have to push my ideas. But one of the things that I've learned is that being able to communicate well and explain things where people can understand them and to you know, go to meetings and actually convince people that you're right. Um, a lot of technologists will be unhappy because they're like, oh, management doesn't listen to me. But I would tell them, like, you're not selling your idea. And so I think, you know, I hope that with my blog and with you know, my new company and my ideas that I can help um, other engineers be better at their jobs because the reality is we don't work in a vacuum. You're not working on code by yourself, or you might be, but um, you might be able to do a lot more if you're, you know, outside and you can kind of communicate. And I don't know, so I'm really passionate about these things, and I think that um, helping people develop best practices and helping people, it really comes down to helping them see what's in it for them. And it helps them see um, how they can be better and why. So it's really learning how to position things and talk about the benefits of it. So whether it's learning um, profiling or it's you know telling people uh, to get better at how they communicate in meetings, you know you have to position it in a way that gives them a reason to care.